These World War I planes bring back memories of Eddie Rickenbacker's Hat in the Ring Squadron, of Von Richthofen's Flying Circus, of French escadrilles and British and Canadian aerodromes. Memories of men who first challenged the sky. They're all gone now, but their spirit lives on at Old Rhinebeck Aerodrome, a small airfield north of New York City. Every Sunday from May through October, Cole Palin and his crew are up before dawn, preparing for their weekly air show. Switch on and go. Okay. Switch on. On and ready. Once a year, early in September, Cole's air show becomes part of a World War I weekend. Today is the World War I radio-controlled aircraft jamboree. A day when Cole shares the skies with other planes, just as authentic, but built to a much smaller scale and controlled by transmitters on the ground. For the modelers, building and flying these old planes is just a sport. For Cole Palin, it's become a major part of his life. I purchased this old abandoned farm in Rhinebeck in uh, 19, late 1958 and uh, had a thousand foot of runway made, started eating peanut butter and jam. It was strictly a low budget operation, uh, but I loved it that way. I was rebuilding planes in the living room of the house uh, and getting in some flying. And to me, that was, well, the most exciting time of my life was the beginning of this, creating this uh, World War I airdrome. About five years ago, some of the members of our Mid-Hudson Radio Control Society who had visited the aerodrome uh, got together over coffee and discussed the possibility of having a World War I jamboree here at the aerodrome. We approached Cole, who is an old modeler himself, and he went for it. So this is how we started. The uh, first contest had about 17 contestants. We've now grown to 126 on last year's meet, and uh, our contestants come from all over the United States, mostly the eastern seaboard. We've had them from as far away as England, Canada, and Mexico. Well, we came down from Vermont just because we heard about it through a friend of ours for a long time. Decided to come down and see it. What do you think so far? Fantastic. It's great. Wow. I was up here as a spectator last year, and I got the bug. I had to build something for the contest. And build they do, in spare rooms, basements, and garages. An airplane is slowly emerging from scraps of cloth and wood and wire. Well, I think the most important thing about building one of these models is to make it look as nearly like the real airplane as possible. In this particular case, I'm building from actual model plans. However, many scale model modelers will use factory drawings as the basis for their ships. The structure of this airplane is primarily a balsa wood, which is very light and very strong. And the model is powered by a half horsepower engine. Inside the plane are four of these small servo mechanisms, which help control the airplane in flight. When I'm flying the airplane, I use this transmitter, which I hold in my hand, and which sends a continuous signal up to a small receiver located in the airplane, which is connected to those servo mechanisms. To make the airplane go up, I pull the stick down and the airplane will climb. When I push the stick forward, the airplane dives. To make it turn to the right, I move the stick to the right. And to make it turn to the left, I move the stick to the left. This lever on the side of the transmitter controls the throttle on the engine. And I can make the engine run from a low idle to high speed by sliding this lever back and forth. Now, of course, when the airplane is finished, you won't be able to see any of the servo mechanisms or the engine or other internal details because the entire model will be covered with silk. Then it's doped and painted. So as I build, I take photographs to document each stage of construction. And these photographs will be used by the judges at Rhinebeck to compare my craftsmanship and attention to detail to that of the original airplane. Strict attention to detail is only the beginning. The proof of any radio control aircraft is in the flying. At Rhinebeck, we have four categories of competition, mission maneuvers, combat, and scale, and all involve flying. That'll start to get right in your eyes. Yeah. Okay, this is not a pass. This is not a pass. Not a pass. Not a pass. This is not a pass. 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 
Uh, when I'm flying at a contest, uh, usually have butterflies for the first the first flight we call our butterfly flight. This once the butterflies get settled down, uh, then you fly. You're completely absorbed in in the airplane. It's just as if uh, there, there were nothing but the plane and yourself. But the mere fact that you can fly a real plane uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you can fly one of these. I've flown real planes, and actually it's, it's much easier to fly them when you're right inside of them than it is to fly them when uh, you're on the ground and the plane is up there, because when it's heading away from you, you give it right and it goes right. When it's heading towards you, you give it right and it goes left. Knowing exactly what the plane will do when you move the control stick is the secret of maneuvers. Competition begins on the ground, where each contestant has three minutes to start his engine and have the plane airborne. In the First World War, it often took eight men to crank up a plane, three on each side to hold down the wings, a strong idiot to swing the propeller, and a pilot to work the priming pump. When the magneto didn't fire, the pilot stayed on the ground. The modeler has another option. If spinning the prop by hand doesn't work, he attaches an electric starter and gets on with the competition. Contestants are required to put their models through a series of specific maneuvers designed for the capabilities of the real aircraft. So while not all planes are flying the same patterns, all are flying patterns equally difficult and are judged on placement in the air, smoothness, speed, and realism. Each maneuver is scored on a one to 10 basis. In judging each maneuver, I look to see how accurately the plane has performed the pre-described flight plan. If the maneuver calls for a perfectly round loop and the loop is less than round, points are again deducted. If the maneuver calls for the plane to enter and leave the maneuver and a straight and level flight and at a particular altitude and these things are not accomplished, points are deducted. The total number of faults found in a maneuver are deducted from a possible 10 and the final score for that maneuver is then entered. While judges tabulate points, each modeler is alone at the controls, guiding his aircraft back to the landing zone below. Coming in here. Excuse me, sir. We'll probably stand back for scoring this landing. Very nice. In the mission event, the modeler gets a maximum of 50 points each for a precision takeoff, bomb drop, balloon attack, and spot landing. This was originally set up to be a fun event, but it's turned out to be one of the most competitive. From the time the modeler lifts his plane off the ground, he's all business. There's an enemy target down there, and he gets one chance to bomb it. Balloon busting simulates destroying an observation balloon, a mission attempted by only the most reckless World War I pilot. The modeler is given five passes with a decreasing number of points for each pass. Of course, the object is to destroy the balloon, not the airplane. Oh, God. Oh, that is so <laughs> the mission event ends with a spot landing. A perfect score can give the modeler 200 points. Most Rhinebeck contestants are able to land their planes on the ground in front of them. But a soft landing was far from routine for the World War I pilot. What happened to her? Did she get out of control? No, it's just a misjudge on distance. I didn't want to fly over the center of the field where another pilot might be taken off. So I tried to keep it off the side to prevent any accident. And getting it over too far over, why, the tree's got it. Looks uh, like much damage? Yeah. Well, it, it could be worse. It always could be worse, you know. Do you climb any trees? No, I'm not accustomed to climbing trees. In mission, it's every contestant for himself. But in the combat event, two men fly as a team, 
simulating a dogfight by using actual World War I tactics and maneuvers. Combat is the most subjective event because there are no specific maneuvers required. The closer two planes come to each other, the more points the team gets. A good mid-air collision will bring a maximum of 24 points and an end to one or both airplanes. The event is a crowd pleaser, and the people at Rhinebeck love it. I think it's the people who come here that make Rhinebeck unique. The jamboree is a family affair and really attracts a cross-section of people. We have everything from the common layman to doctors, lawyers, engineers, professional people. But all the contestants seem to have one thing in common, a love of aviation, and particularly model aviation. If a contestant wipes out his plane, as long as he's had a chance to fly it, he usually will say, well, I, that's what I built it for. I built it to take the Rhinebeck and fly it. I flew it, and I'm happy. During the day, it's strictly competition, but at night, everyone gets together around the campfire. We had a contest down in Montreal where uh, it was one of these uh, contests that uh, we couldn't get any good turnouts for a regular contest. So one of the fellas rigged up a contest where you roll the dice and whatever number you got in the dice, you had to go up and do that many a number of loops and they were timing. It was all timed. So one of the uh, gizmos was that we, the wives would all try to fly and the wife that held the transmitter for the longest number of seconds yeah. would win the prize. So it was my wife's turn and uh, she had the controls and the airplane. It was a little top dog and it was going like... Straight down. <laughs> down. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I said, it's getting close to the ground. You better give up. She says, all right. Or you can join it. It was death, more or less. And I decided I'd join it to the extent that I decided you might as well capitalize and create things out of this. So I wrote a song. Oh. All can about. we hear it? Yeah. Why don't you? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> called Model Airplane Blues. And if I forget some of the words, you'll have to excuse me, because I can't ever remember my song. What's the first line, honey? <laughs> well, since I met you, honey, this life of mine has changed, because love is Reconciled to my secondary role, but it's hard to be romantic by radio control. I'd like to hold your hand in mine, but every time I do, our hands get stuck together with your motto. Clear the prop, please. Prop clear. Buzzer, we've got. Okay. Early Sunday morning, while the modelers are still dreaming of a perfect flight, Cole Palin and his crew are warming up the planes for his air show. Oh, I see. All right, that darn thing's working on it. Don't know why. <laughs> that's not very good. And that's my yeah. dual ignition system, too. Come ready. Okay, switch on. Right back. I just love old airplanes, and I fly them. I break them, and I fix them. But more than that, I like to think I'm preserving their history, maybe recreating a bit of history with these old planes.
I first came in contact with him at Roosevelt Field, where there had been a museum in the early 30s. When I heard the field was going to be closed, I, I couldn't help but wonder what would happen to the old World War I planes. At that time, I was going with a young lady, and I suppose to try to impress her, I acted like I was going to buy these old airplanes. And I was amazed to find out that indeed they were for sale. As it turned out, I did get the planes, and I lost the girl. years we had air shows here just formally flying the airplanes but we found that uh, we were getting more people helping us fly the airplanes on the other side of the fence than we were having paid customers coming in to watch our show so we evolved a little a little melodrama based on a hero the Percy Goodfellow the villain the black baron and Truly true of. Throughout our melodrama, the Black Baron is trying to picnic with Trudy True Love, but he's always being interrupted by Sir Percy Goodfellow's henchmen who are flying in the skies above. That's roughly the story. I say roughly because our story was never written and it's always changing. Whenever a new piece of equipment becomes available, we try to work it into the show by making our story a bit more involved. Now I'm collecting old cars, so we're working them into the show. Old cars and planes, they go together. They, they were born together, really. And we like to use them in old motorcycles in our story. I think it's great. It brings back something that we seem to have lost, uh, the past and our forefathers. And we, uh, we like to bring back the color and everything. The hero of our melodrama is Dick King, who takes the part of Sir Percy Goodfellow and flies his own Sopwith pub. Stanley Segalis is a flying farmer and also one-shot Gatling. Dave Fox plays a part of the Regal Eagle. Gee, when they taxi the old planes down the runway in front of the audience, there's, there's just a wave of cameras coming up and there must be 500 pictures taken during every takeoff. I think that the color and spectacle of these old planes makes this a great place for taking pictures. I'm making myself up now as the villainous Black Baron, uh, the biggest villain of all, who every, everybody gets to boo in hiss throughout our, our melodrama. During his picnic, the Black Baron gets bombed with charcoal bombs by Sir Percy Goodfellow's henchmen. He considers this a challenge, and he takes off in his Fulker triplane to shoot down his adversaries. Sir Percy sees how unfair the fight is, and takes off in his Sopwith pup to protect one-shot Gatling flying his arrow. the dogfight, Sir Percy Goodfellow gets shot down in white smoke, and then the Black Baron gets shot down in black smoke. But somehow they both survive, and when the Black Baron lands, he has one bomb left. Being the big show-off that he is, he keeps throwing this bomb up and catching it. Finally, he drops it. The bomb blows up, and the Black Baron has destroyed himself. But like all fairy tales, this one ends happily. The Black Baron is brought back to life by Truly, true love's kiss. And everybody, of course, lives happily ever after. Of all the great aviators to come out of the First World War, perhaps the most courageous was a funny-looking dog with a big black nose. Flying from a base deep in Allied Rhinebeck territory, his Sopwith doghouse is the best known of the radio-controlled novelty aircraft. <laughs> While our hero goes to quaff a few root beers, 
A camera in another novelty aircraft is photographing his every movement. This is a camera carrying glider. I have under the wing a Kodak Instamatic spring wound camera. It's controlled by a servo, which is also the throttle servo up in the front. It's actuated like this when it's in flight. First, I turn the transmitter on, turn the radio and the plane on. When I move from high throttle to low throttle, the camera takes the picture, like that. When I move back into high throttle, it resets itself for the next picture. Another modeler, not content with still pictures, has mounted a movie camera on his novelty aircraft. Uh, the airplane is a nine-foot Taylor Cub, powered by a Cox chainsaw engine. Uh, the camera, Kodak movie camera. The camera gets mounted on the plane and is servo actuated from the ground, from the transmitter. I've been flying the camera and the plane combination for three years. I used to film on lecture tours and uh, at adult school. The combination works out very well. Films like this one, taken in Super 8 and blown up to 16 millimeter, show the modeler how stable his aircraft is in the air and give him a new perspective on the plane's flight characteristics and maneuverability. Hey, Lou, you ready for judging? Why? Well, here's the airplane. For the Rhinebeck contestant, scale is the ultimate in competition. You have your scale for Can I have the presentation? You'll find in here that there's a picture of the real plane and the actual construction has been duplicated all the way down the line. Photographs the modeler took when building his plane prove that he has authentically duplicated the nuances in color and details of construction of the real plane. I don't know if that's a commercial. Everything is in accurate scale. The instruments and controls that guided the planes, the machine guns that fired through and often into the propeller blades before a synchronizing mechanism was invented. Bombs that were carried in an aircraft that was no heavier than a motorcycle today. The bright colors of daredevil pilots who believed they were invincible in the sky. The spirit of that era lives on at Rhinebeck today, where scraps of cloth and wood and wire have somehow been made into a flying machine. Insignia of that bygone era are displayed proudly as judges examine each part of the plane's construction. The fuselage, sometimes fashioned from laminated plywood. The engine that carried the pilot through the skies at less than 100 miles an hour. Which way? cloth-covered wings that might fly off in a steep dive, the landing gear that touched down in any clear area available, the tail surfaces, the paint job, the overall general appearance. In each category of competition, the judges award a maximum of 50 points. 25 of these are for workmanship, 25 for attention to detail. Well, it's hard to believe this is too realistic in here. Uh, on my side, he has done some repair over here, but not very neat. And fitting the tail in. So he did put his little window in and a cute little clamp on the thing. Uh, I got even the middle teams. Okay, he had a 17, he had a 6, 15, 15. You object to 15, you insist on the contestant scale points will be totaled and multiplied by the score he received in the maneuvers competition. Combat and mission points will be added in, and a grand prize winner will be selected. But to the Rhinebeck contestant, winning is not as important as just being there. You can always tell the age of the child by the size of his toys. I think uh, little youngsters have their, their sandbox toys, their bulldozers and what have you, and us bigger boys, we just have these bigger airplanes, that's all.